listening to the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. This is Shane Vanderhart. Welcome back to another episode. I apologize for the hiatus. I I looked back at when the last podcast was and I said, holy cow, that was like at the beginning of the month. I, I never intended to go this long uh, without recording a, another podcast. I really do want to try to do these on a weekly basis, but sometimes life gets in the way. Uh, maybe you've already experienced this. My wife and I ha- are now officially... Uh, empty nesters, which um, it, 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 on one hand, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the change. On the other hand, it's it's weird, um, especially I work from home. And so, uh, you know, my daughter, my youngest daughter who moved uh, to go to college, she's going to nursing school up at Allen College in Waterloo. Um, she'd been home for a while um, after gra- high school graduation doing general education um, and working. So... It, it, you know, so a lot in a lot of respects, she was gone a lot anyway, but it's still a lot quieter at night. And, um, you know, it's just it's been a change. Her, the dog that used to follow her around her mini schnauzer now is like my, you know, my little shadow constantly following me around. It's just it's weird. It's going to take some time for my wife and I to get used to. Uh, so, you know, if you any tips, uh, any suggestions, um, you know, feel free to drop me a line, Shane at caffeinatedthoughts.com. Um, I would appreciate it. My wife and I, I think are both going to get involved in uh, Bible study fellowship this fall, which will be good. And uh, we, we, uh, we've gone to our church for a while now, um, Cottage Grove Church in Des Moines, but we've not really got plugged into a small group yet. So I think we're going to probably look at doing that as well. Uh, so making some changes that way and providing a little more structure to our lives, I think would be good. So, uh, but anyway, any suggestions, uh, if you're an empty nester, uh, to help with the transition, I would certainly appreciate it. I had a, a great phone call th- this morning, uh, with a friend of mine, Dr. Cal E. Calvin Beisner, Cal, we call him. He's the founder and the, um, national spokesperson for the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Um, I think I got that right. Cornwall Alliance is pretty much what we call them. But uh, he had an article in the uh, American Spectator where he was responding to a Vox article that asked the question, is wealth um, immoral? And that's an interesting question. So he and I discussed that. But before we get to that conversation, first a word from our sponsor, American Principles Project. At American Principles Project, we believe that human dignity should be at the heart of public policy. We work in all 50 states and in Washington, D.C. to promote life, religious freedom, local control over education, authentic economic progress for working Americans, and a return to constitutional principles such as federalism. Want to help American Principles Project? Visit our website today, AmericanPrinciplesProject.org. That's AmericanPrinciplesPlesProject.org. Sign up for email updates. Help us out. We want to work with you. That's AmericanPrinciplesProject.org. And we're back. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Calvin Beisner. Cal, welcome to the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. Uh, glad you could join us. Well, thank you very much. It's a uh, it's a privilege and a delight to be back with you again. Yeah. Hey. Well, you you wrote an interesting article for the American Spectator called "A Sad Tale of Wealthy Millennials: Moral Confusion." Uh, could you uh, just talk to us a, a little bit about um, first of all, where did you get the idea for the for the the article and and what are some things you learned as you were writing it? Mm. Well, it is in many respects a response to an article in Vox by uh, an Adam Roberts, who is a millennial and who writes of his own feeling of guilt for having inherited over a million dollars from his parents, and especially when he found out where the parents made their money, parents and grandparents for that matter, uh, by investments in banking, investments in fossil fuel companies, uh, investments in some companies that produced items used by our military. And so he felt as if he were somehow morally guilty, tainted 
by having inherited wealth uh, mm. at all, and particularly from sources like that. Uh, he felt that there's something wrong with the world in which some people can have a great abundance while others you know, others struggle to make ends meet. Uh, he felt that uh, we need to have an economic order in which it is impossible for some people to amass great wealth while others uh, remain in great need. Hmm. And, you know... We, uh, we, 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 we've seen that historically already. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't it yeah. doesn't work. Well, we've seen we've seen places that have tried to make it impossible for there to be great inequality between wealth and poverty. Uh and what that always does is it results in in a different sort of inequality. An inequality between those who are uh who are who who, who hold the guns and those who <laughs> receive the bullets. Uh, right. the, the history of, of socialism, of uh, countries that have renounced private property and put all the means of productions in the hand of the state, uh, that history is one of mass murder. Uh, communism, uh, communist governments, socialist governments uh, murdered over 100 million of their own people in the 20th century. That's the direction that, of course, that we don't want to go. And I would assume that Adam Roberts doesn't want to go there either, but uh, apparently he's too young to remember uh, mm -hmm. the, the the sad history of that. Uh, uh, he hasn't looked very carefully at the places that are still dominated by socialism, like Cuba or North Korea or uh, Venezuela more recently. And apparently his education wasn't good enough in history for him to be aware of the things that he's too young to have experienced himself. Probably his, his history probably focused on more about how America was bad than, yeah. than anything else. It seems like there's, uh, and I've, I've noticed a lot of deconstruction of American history, uh, particularly with yeah. the founding, if they even cover the founding at all. Um, yeah. So it's yeah, unfortunately and, not surprising. And Shane, there's plenty in American history of which we should be uh, properly ashamed. And plenty right. in American history from which we should repent. But there's also a great deal in American history of which we should be very, very pleased, and which we should celebrate, and which we should preserve. Uh, in fact, I, I just got off a, a week-long road trip. Uh, during which I listened to the audio version of Eric Metaxas's new book, If You Can Keep It. And that's something mm -hmm. that I would recommend to all of your listeners. Uh, it's a wonderful study of uh, just the, uh, the, the importance of recognizing the fine things about America at the very same time that we acknowledge the sins of our past and of our present and seek to repair uh, what we've done wrong while we preserve what we've done right. Right, right. So he has his article, um, you know, asked the primary question, is wealth immoral? How would you answer that? Well, Adam Roberts uh, clearly thinks that wealth is immoral. He thinks that we should have an economic order that prevents anyone from amassing great wealth. Of course, uh, you know, it's impossible on any objective standard to to say, okay, where do we draw the line? Is a thousand dollars net worth uh, too much, too little? How about a hundred thousand? How about a million, ten million? Uh, there's no way to draw the line somewhere on any objective criteria. Uh, and it's going to vary greatly as you go from one society to another. Uh, someone very wealthy by Bangladeshi standards is poor by American standards. Someone uh, poor by American standards is actually probably has has greater net worth and greater property than the average Western European. Uh, so <laughs> there are all kinds of problems in terms of, of uh, making objective criteria for what he's talking about. But the the fundamental problem is in the notion that there is some uh, level of wealth above which you are immoral for holding it and below which you're okay. Uh, mm. The Bible never talks that way. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of the most important characters in, in the Bible were very wealthy people. Job, Abraham, uh, 
Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, David, uh, Solomon, uh, Ar- Joseph of Arimathea, the wealthy women who who supported Jesus and their, his disciples as they as they did their itinerant ministry. Uh, wealthy women in uh, in Acts who provide, uh, I think of Lydia, for instance, a, a seller of purple, which was a very high-end luxury product in her day, uh, who supported the Apostle Paul in his ministry. So uh, wealth is not, uh, you know, it's not a sin to be wealthy. It's not sinful to hold wealth. What it is sinful to do is to idolize your wealth and to turn a cold, uncaring heart on those who are in need. Uh, and the, the scriptures make that very clear. But what they also make clear is that our response to the needs of the poor needs to be uh, a response that reflects the grace of God. God, of course, doesn't owe anyone salvation. Uh, what hmm. justice would call for in relation to every one of us, since we're all sinners, is that we all go to hell. So mm-hmm. it's not a matter of justice for God to bring us salvation in Jesus Christ. It's a matter of grace, of his giving benefits where the opposite is what's deserved. Uh, right. And that should be what characterizes our response to poverty as well. We want to do, do uh, charity. We want to do grace. And that must always be be uh, voluntary. It can never be forced by the demand that if you don't give to this person, we're going to fine you, we're going to imprison you, perhaps we'll shoot you. Hmm. So certainly Adam Roberts uh, decided to give his wealth away, right, if he had a problem with having it? Well, it's interesting. He writes about that very thing. He says that uh, up to the time that he wrote this article, he had given away about a third of what he had inherited, and he intended to give away the other two-thirds. The problem is that if being wealthy is immoral, then it's analogous uh, to murdering. (laughs) Well, you know, if you're murdering and suddenly you realize, oh, this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing this, should you taper off? <laughs> well, let's see. I used to wear, murder 10 people a month. Now I'm going to murder five per month. And next month I'll murder only three. Or should you just stop right now? And the fact is that if holding all that wealth is immoral, he should have given it all away immediately. Now, he hasn't thought that through, of course. And frankly, by the way, I actually admire his compassion toward the poor. That's very clear in his article. It's good to see someone who is wealthy having that kind of an attitude. Uh, I admire his decision to have given away a third of what he has. Uh, And I'll admire his decision to give away the rest when when he has done that. What's wrong is his thinking that having the wealth is somehow or other immoral in the first place and that government ought to step in to make sure that nobody has that much that anybody who does has have that much has some of it taken away and given it to those who don't that is injustice even as even at the same time that it's called social justice it's really truly injustice and the confusion of that with compassion charity grace actually leads to a confusion of the gospel itself because the gospel is that we are justified by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Okay. Uh, so uh, what should our approach be? Um, you know, obviously, I, I, I don't think I'm in danger of inheriting a million dollars. Uh, that'd be a good problem to have, but <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. So, But, you, you know, people, uh, uh, oftentimes a goal for a lot of people and is, you know, basically accumulating wealth or trying to build wealth for retirement so we can retire comfortably. Um, as as we approach, you know, just have, having money, I mean, what should our attitude be? Well, I think John Wesley got it right uh, when he said, uh, uh, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. <laughs> You know, you can't give away what you don't have. 
You right. can't have what you don't earn unless you steal it or are given it, given it by someone else charitably or given it by somebody else who has stolen it. Uh, so what we need to do is earn through uh, just and, and moral activity as much as we can so that we can give as much as we can to those who are in need. You know, one of the first things that you need to do in order to help the poor is not be one of them. You know, if, if, you, if you don't that, have that money, should, you can't give money without, away. That should go without saying, but yeah, it seems like some people don't realize that. I mean, yeah, if, you we would think all, so. if, we, if we were all poor, we couldn't help the poor. Um, That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's as people become wealthier that they can afford the steps necessary to, uh, to improve production systems so that what used to be affordable only for the wealthy becomes affordable for the poor. Uh, this is why, uh, why the average so-called poor American has more purchasing power than the average Western European. And of course, the average Western European has far more purchasing power than the average Indian or Chinese. And the average Indian or Chinese has more purchasing power than the average Bangladeshi or, or uh, North Korean, for that matter. Uh, it takes the building up of wealth to lift everyone out of poverty. And that's one of the things that the Cornwall Alliance is focused on is how whole societies can grow and stay out of poverty. And to do that, you need a set of social institutions, private property rights, entrepreneurship, free trade, limited government, the rule of law, and uh, access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy. And much of the environmental movement is opposed to all of that, which is why we, we see ourselves as trying to defend true biblical earth stewardship as an alternative to environmentalism. Yeah, you made some interesting, you made some good comments about fossil fuels and, and this gentleman's uh, uh, view of, of fossil fuels being immoral. Um, yeah. But, you know, but fossil fuels have done much to, to lift, uh, you know, third, you know, developing countries out of poverty. Um, so can you speak on that a little bit? Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, all the way back in the 1870s, an American theologian, and I've forgotten now his name, wrote a full book on the importance of oil to lifting people out of poverty in the United States. What he recognized and what has become increasingly clear over the more than a century since then, a century and a half since then, is that everything we produce requires energy. And the more energy you can have, the more you can produce. So if you want to lift whole societies out of poverty and keep them out of poverty, you need abundant, affordable, reliable energy. Well, Fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas are far and away our greatest source, aside from nuclear, of abundant, affordable, reliable energy. But the, the uh, global warming alarmist movement, the environmental movement as a whole, wants us to stop using fossil fuels. Well, essentially, that would be to condemn humanity to descend back into poverty. Uh, fossil fuels provide about 85% of all the energy in the world right now, and they're going to continue to do that for probably at least another century, uh, and could do that for many centuries beyond it. Uh, the problem we can't predict because uh, technologies change so much. Who could have who could have imagined a, a century ago that France would be getting 80% of its energy from nuclear uh, fission? by 1970, but that's what happened. Uh, so we can't predict much farther off, but we do know that it takes a very long time to change major energy infrastructure, and we're not going to see fossil fuels dwindle away for at least a century. Right, right. Um, yeah, and you made, you know, just it, it's just amazing. People don't even think about everything that fossil fuels have, you know, like petroleum. 
of the different products that we've even been able to, to thousands develop. of byproducts. Right, because um, you made the point about how uh, this this um, general Adam was okay with. Uh, you know, oh, let's see, now I'm looking for it in the article here. Well, he says he says it's okay if you're getting wealthy because you make strides in medicine, uh, uh, but he okay. forgets that an awful lot of medicines are actually uh, made from petroleum, from, from byproducts of petroleum. Uh, doctors wouldn't be able to treat an awful lot of diseases were it not for the fact that we lift petroleum out of the ground, you know, we drill it and, and pump it up out of the ground, and we make some of it into fuel, and we make some of it into plastics, and we make some of it into medications, and some of it mm. into fertilizers, some of it into pesticides that allow us to grow far more food on far less land, preserving habitat for wildlife. I mean, it's, it really is an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. There, a question kind of popped up into my mind. It may or not question, I guess. I, I remember this this pastor talking to me, and I want to kind of get your thoughts on it because it's related. He said he, if a, a member of his congregation won the lottery, he would not accept any money from them in the form of, of giving. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I, I think the pastor obviously has to follow his own conscience on that. Right. Um, I, I think state-sponsored lotteries are very, very bad things because essentially they are redistribution of wealth from the foolish to the non-foolish. Uh, only the fool <laughs> thinks that he's going to get wealthy by buying lottery tickets. On right. you know, Very, very rare individuals do get wealthy by buying lottery tickets, uh, but they are, uh, you know, the very fact that one person does get you know, a hundred million dollars or something like that tells you that millions and millions of persons have lost the money that they put into buying the lottery tickets. Right. Uh, so I think state-sponsored lotteries are basically uh, an immoral thing. And so if a pastor says, I want to uh, discourage people from, from participating in lotteries, uh, by saying that our church would refuse to accept a donation from somebody who got his money from a lottery. Well, okay, I, I can see that. Uh, I don't think that it's an absolute uh, requirement, though. Yeah, okay. You know, I, I was thinking, it's like, yeah, I, at the time I was working for a nonprofit, it's like, well, you know, if somebody <laughs> wants to be generous with that money, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> but my case, yeah. okay. You know, I, I, I guess, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just because, some, you know, while wealth itself is not immoral, obviously there are ways you can obtain wealth through immoral means. And, yes. it just, and, and it, it's just curious, you know, I'm just, I was just kind of curious about your thoughts about how, you know, we respond to people who want to be generous with that wealth. But, well, um, I, uh, to, to make it a little simpler, I mean, there, there are more and less simple and and obvious situations like that. If you see a guy break into a house and carry out a TV, and then he wants to sell you that TV, it's pretty obvious you should not buy that TV from him because he right. doesn't have a right to, the, to that TV. He shouldn't be selling it. Now, somebody who buys a lottery ticket, what he's done is voluntary. What all the other people who buy the lottery tickets have done is voluntary. Right. Uh, stupid is not the same thing as immoral. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, my thoughts, if I ever won the lottery, I'd be expecting to get hit by lightning, Max. Uh, well, I hope you never win it, because if you win it, you have to have bought the tickets, and that was a foolish thing to do. Right, right. And that, <laughs> yeah, that's why I told my wife, like, well, I, I can't, you, you know, the phrase, you can't win if you don't play. Well, <laughs> I'll never win the yeah. lottery. No, if somebody else wants to buy lottery tickets and then give them to you and they turn right. out to win, well, okay, different matter, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody else wants to be a fool and then give you the profits, well, right. okay. Yeah. More power to them. They'll probably come back and say, hey, Shane, you remember that ticket I gave you? <laughs> anyway, totally, totally off the subject here. So um, I was trying to. 
Any additional thoughts about this? I guess I, I'm, I'm running out of questions here, so I don't want to. Well, I think what what really lies at the root of of uh, Adam Roberts's confusion is that he doesn't understand the difference between justice and grace, uh, mm -hmm. the difference between what is due and what we give uh, out of charity. He's confused the two, and that is of the very essence of the social, uh, social justice movement. And what we need to do is we need to define justice biblically, which is what I've done in a, a, a book called Prosperity and Poverty, the Compassionate Use of Resources in a World of Scarcity, and also in a, a short booklet called Social Justice versus Biblical Justice, How Good Intentions Undermine Justice and Gospel. Uh, the biblical definition of, of justice that I, I think that we can develop as we look at how that word is used all through Scripture is mm -hmm to render impartially and proportionally to everyone his due in accord with the righteous standard of God's moral law. So justice renders what is due. Grace, by contrast, gives benefits to those who are due punishment. And the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that we are justified which is a wonderful benefit. We're forgiven of our mm -hmm. sins and declared righteous in God's sight by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you confuse justice and grace, then you begin to think that you're justified by a combination of grace plus merits. Uh, you can actually earn your salvation, uh, that you're justified uh, by grace plus merits through faith plus works, your own or others, uh, in Christ plus someone else, yourself, your parents, uh, your church, whatever, and that completely distorts the gospel. But the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, uh, and therefore it's something that we need to keep uh, clearly defined. To do that, we need to define justice and grace properly, and unfortunately that's what uh, Adam Roberts doesn't do. And I pray that, uh, that he will come to encounter the true gospel, come to faith in Christ, uh, be forgiven of his sins, and have reconciliation with God, and then recognize the mistakes of his thinking in the past. Okay. Um, I'll have to have you on just to talk specifically about uh, uh, social justice as it, as it presents itself within the church. Uh, because you know we're obviously seeing a a, a a growing movement. I'm thinking about some of the the overtures that the Southern Baptist Convention yeah. have have yes. done, and and uh, the Gospel Coalition. And I'd be interested to pick your brains about about that. But I want to give you a chance to prepare, and I need to prepare and do a little reading as well. So we'll have to yeah. have you back on for that. So thank Love you so it. hey, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, and take care. All right. Well, thank you very much, Shane. God bless you. And, uh, you know, uh, if anyone would like to get a copy of my booklet, Social Justice versus Biblical Justice, if mm -hmm. they go to cornwallalliance.org, that's cornwallalliance.org, and just make a donation of any size, no matter how small or preferably how large, and <laughs> ask for Social Justice versus Biblical Justice, we'll be delighted to send a copy of that absolutely free of charge uh, as our way of saying thank you for the donation and the donation will be 100 percent tax deductible so cornwallalliance.org scroll down to the donate button click on it and you can do it quickly and easily online and ask for social justice versus biblical justice well hey thank you so much and i'll include a, a link to that as well so um great thank take you care. Very well. Right, Take too. care, my friend. Bye-bye. Right. Right, Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this uh, podcast. I, I hope you found it interesting. I know I, I sure did, and and I, I'm looking forward to having Cal Beisner come back so we could talk about social justice, more about social justice versus biblical justice and, and the impact the social justice movement has made within evangelicalism. Uh, so look for that down the road, hopefully pretty soon. Um, if you happen to be listening to this podcast somewhere other than on our website, please make sure to check out caffeinatedthoughts.com. Again, that's caffeinatedthoughts, 
dot com c a f f e i n a t e d thoughts dot com. You could just Google caffeinated thoughts, and we'll show up at the top of your search screen. Also, you can subscribe to this podcast uh, with through several means. Uh, one. I think probably our most popular one is through Apple Podcasts. And if you happen to listen to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, please be sure to give us a five-star rating. Um, We'd appreciate that. Also, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, Podbean. I think that's all of them so far. If you have an app that we're not right now connected to, you know, let me know. Drop me a line, Shane at caffeinatedthoughts.com, and we'll see if we can make that happen. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, sign up for our emails. Um, that way you don't miss a single update. Hey, this is Shane Vanderhart. Thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of the week and weekend. Take care, everybody. <music>